thank you so much for um, all the questions that you've uh, submitted. Um, we can't ask all of them, unfortunately, but uh, um, I'll, I'll ask some anyway. Um, so, thank you very much. Um, to start off with a very difficult um, question, Ard, what is your Erdos Bacon number? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I well, we might need to explain what that is. I, I, I think it's five two. Okay. Um, so it, I forget. Okay, so the Erdos number is Paul Erdos is a great mathematician who wrote about a thousand papers, collaborated with lots of people. If you collaborate with Paul Erdos, you have an Erdos number of one. If you collaborate with somebody who collaborated with Paul Erdos, you've got an Erdos number of two, etc. The Bacon number is if you've been in a film <laughs> with Kevin Bacon, you have a Bacon number of one. If you've been in a film with somebody who's been in a film with Kevin Bacon, then you have a bacon number of two. So my bacon number is two because I was with um, Morgan Freeman. And my earliest number, I think, is four or five. I forget what it is, four or five, because I worked with people who worked with people who worked with um, Paul Erdos. This is a classic uh, geek thing. Um. <laughs> okay, anyway, sorry. Sorry, just, uh, that was just to satisfy the geek, geek in, in, in some of us. But anyway, um, the serious question this time. Um, if a question is unanswerable scientifically, then why study it? Well, there are lots of questions that are unanswerable um, in the sense of scientifically unanswerable, but they're perfectly interesting questions. And so if I, if I ask, um, uh, does my wife love me, okay, then the question would be, should I look at that scientifically? Now, if I took a kind of scientific approach to this and said to my wife, well, in science, we don't believe things until we have enough evidence for them, so I'm going to assume that you don't love me until you show me enough evidence that you do. <laughs> There's a lot of evidence that I would never see, okay? Because obviously, that wouldn't, that's not a healthy way of having a, a relationship. And in fact, if I think of another example of a question that's really important, it's very closely linked, if I want to decide, if I want to ask myself, should I marry a particular person? So in my case, my wife. It's not like I did a bunch of repeatable experiments in marriage and so I was happy with it. Um, that's not a good idea either. In fact, it's not even that we did, in fact, this compatibility test that you do, you know, where you measure, where you count, you know, all kinds of questions, what kind of food you like, what kind of movies you like, where, where do you squeeze the toothpaste? But you don't marry somebody because you both score 97% on it. And the reason that you don't do that is because you don't know what it's like to be married until you're married. There's a commitment that has to come first before the evidence comes. And so it's a decision you have to make that you cannot explain scientifically. Now, science can help you, maybe, with some adjudication, but it's not the right way of thinking about it. It's the wrong, it's just a category error. And so that's an example of a kind of question that many people in this room have made or will have made, should I marry person X or person Y? Um, and using science, you won't have a definitive answer to the question. And if you want to have definitive answers, you'll be waiting around forever. You need to commit at some point. Um, and, uh, and that's because that's the way the world is. In fact, I would say religious knowledge has that characteristic to it. So there's religious evidence that is not available to us until we've committed to God. This is, would be a traditional Christian way of thinking about our relationship with God. There's things we don't see until we've committed to God. That doesn't mean that you should just walk out on the street and grab the first best person you see and marry them. And say, say, marry, say them, marry me. If, you, if I went on the street and said that to a woman, uh, that would be very scary. If she said yes, that would be even scarier. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, the f uh, if you have small children, you watch Frozen, right? You know, Hans, and he's the baddie in the end, but they decide to get married on the same day. It's not good. It's because we do have ways of adjudicating these questions. Like, you get to know the other person. You see whether you would like to be around the person. That's pretty important. You see whether your friends or people you trust uh, think highly of this person. If your friends tell you that person's toxic, then that's something you should listen to and care about. Uh, you do the compatibility test I mentioned. There's lots of other things you might do. There's lots of ways that communities have worked out ways of helping people make that decision, but it's fundamentally not a scientific decision. And it's a super, I mean, and I can think of lots of examples in life that have that nature to them. We make decisions, we, we answer questions all the time, but science is not the, science may help us somewhat, but it's just the wrong category. Well, thank you very much, that's a very clear answer. Um, next question is, um, do you think morals are consciously learned or the result of genetically inherited instinct? Or do you think they originate from a higher being? Uh, that's, very, those are, that's a very good question. So when we talk about morality, it's, we have to be careful and, and unpick 
different ways of thinking about moral talk. So we all have certain instincts or predilections or certain, we might have an instinct towards violence or not have violence. In fact, that may be genetic, it could be social. So if you've been badly treated, badly hurt as a child by your parents, you're statistically more likely to be violent towards your own children. That's because you've, that's a tendency that you have. That's one example of something bad. If you've been well treated, might, something good might happen. Then there's a, that's a question of, and, and your, our genetics in, un, unquestionably gives us certain predilections versus others. We have certain things we, we tend to want to do. Males are much more likely to want to be sexual and faithful than females. That's genetically probably true. That doesn't tell you whether it's right or not. Right? There's another question, which is a kind of uh, a moral question about or is it right to behave this way or not that way? It's different from the question about whether I've got certain moral tendencies or not. And then there's a level above that, which you might call some meta, so those are ethical questions. There's a kind of meta-ethical question, which is where do those ethics come from? And in that question, all three were interlinked, where they were asked, do I think that genetics makes us, has moral component? And the answer is yes, just like our socialization has moral components. Nothing new or strange about that. Um, are certain things right or wrong? I believe that they are. So there's a big <coughs> distinction between moral realists who believe that things are right or wrong, or things are socially, only, only socially constructed. But unquestionably, our moral um, kind of behavior and our moral um, environment is socially constructed. Just watch the difference between two different cultures, or even between probably Hull and a few cities down, how people behave, what they consider to be right or wrong. Netherlands, where I come from, is a country well known for its directness. And so uh, my wife and I, after we got married, a few months later, we saw my parents again. The first thing my mother said to me is, says, oh, you have gained weight, um, <laughs> which uh, in many other cultures we consider very rude. But in Netherlands, that's just saying the right thing. So that's something socially constructive. I'm not saying whether that was the right thing or wrong thing to say, but I'm used to that with my Dutch mother. Um, <laughs> And so there are there's aspects of our moral behavior which are um, social, but that doesn't mean they're nothing but social. Right? There's lots of things that are that, that we think are true. I believe it's morally wrong to torture children for pleasure. I think I'm pretty sure that's universal in this room, uh, and I believe that's wrong whether I, I, you believe it or not. If you tell me you don't believe it, I, I'm right. I'll say you are wrong. Right? And I can think of many other, other. That's one extreme example I use. So. I think moral realism is true. Then there's a meta question, which is where do these morals come from? Right? Why are they there? Right? And that's uh, another, our Christians would traditionally say they come because they're linked to the character of God. Um, and actually, there's lots of interesting arguments about exactly how that works. Um, but the idea is very strong that if there is a God behind this world, then we expect there to be moral truths. I'll, gi I'll give you, I'll spin riff on this in a different direction. So in our film, Why Are We Here? We, we have a whole section on morality and, um, and lots of interesting things. We share a lot of moral behaviors with animals, for example. That's not at all surprising, um, or it's actually quite interesting. But doesn't mean that doesn't tell us whether these moral behaviors are right or wrong, or not true or, or true or not true. But the idea that there may be moral truths that are true, whether we believe it or not, and are non-scientific things, but nevertheless true, is not that much stranger than the idea that there are mathematical truths that are true, regardless of whether we can adjudicate them scientifically or not. So any mathematician or anybody who does mathematics, at some point you'll start getting into mathematics, which is very far removed from the natural world. You can start with something like the imaginary numbers, which when they were first came up with were assumed <coughs> to be non-physical. We now use them everywhere in quantum mechanics. Okay? It's a common experience that we have these things that we discover. But the experience of discovering mathematical truth is almost universal among people that work on these kinds of things. So these mathematical truths were true. So I squared was equal to minus one uh, long before uh, any of us existed. And it's true whether you know about it or not. And it's, it's simply, it's a truth. The question then is, what's the physical instantiation of that truth? You know, is, is that truth hiding somewhere behind the moon? No, it's not. It's a non-material reality, which is true. In the same way, it's not at all surprising to me that there would be moral truths that are uh, true and that are non-material truths, just like the laws of mathematics are non-material truths. Nothing surprising about them. I don't need to be a Platonist to believe in this. I don't have to believe there's some kind of factual form. They're just things that are true, but they happen not to be um, empirically, uh, they, they, at least their verification doesn't depend on empirical realities. I can prove a mathematical formula is true or not using the laws of logic. I don't need to do an experiment. That they're true. 
Now, in the question of morality, it's much harder. It's much harder to adjudicate. But that doesn't mean that we throw up in the towel and say that, therefore, there is no answer. I think there are things that are true and things that are not true in the moral realm. It's clearly a much more clouded and complicated uh, uh, um, field, simply because we see that cultures vary. And so we should be very, that means that we should be careful about, we should also be careful about thinking that our own culture is somehow better than another culture, because we happen to go brought up that way. It doesn't mean that we're right. We might need to learn from other cultures about moral truth. Um. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, I wonder, uh, uh, I'd like to sort of throw questions for, for uh, live uh, questions, so I'll, I'll sort of mic one in, in place. Um, I'd like to, first of all, uh, maybe say, uh, is there anyone from the university, either staff or student, so just, just kind of just give different sections sort of uh, opportunity. Anybody from the university would like um, to ask a question? Okay, I see. So what do I believe about life after death? So I believe that, I believe classic Christian tradition that there is a continuity between now and afterlife and that there is something will be in relationship with God. Perfectly classic Christian beliefs. Sorry, so I believe, can you hear me better now? I believe in, um, in some kind of continuity between this life and the next, that in the Bible, it speaks about will be in new creations and in contact with God in a new creation. Um, pretty much uncontroversial in Christian circles, controversial outside, obviously. Um. Did you want to, Do you want to uh, elaborate on that? No, no sorry. Yeah. 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 I understand the question. What's the evidence, sort of? Uh, no, that, no, no. I, I think that's an excellent question. So the question was, um, I'll repeat it for the camera. So the question was, if consciousness is is embedded in the substrate of our brain in the neurons and electric impulses, and that stops when we die, how, how does that work? You know what happens to us in the future? Well, that's a perfectly legitimate, interesting question. So if you believe, as I believe, that God um, not only um, created the world but sustains the world, then God is somehow much greater than nature. And therefore, what Christians believe is it's not very hard for God to make a continuity between what is our physical instantiation and something else in the future, you can just simply recreate it. And the minute you posit something like a God who created this world with his unbelievable complexity and his elegance, that's a small step. Right? If you don't believe there's a God and you wanna say, I'm gonna look at the laws of nature, then you have a problem with that step. But that's a problem with your assumptions, not a problem with your logic. Yeah, and unquestionably, when we talk about what hap life after death, we're talking about something outside of the laws of nature as we know it. And I've actually, if you Google my Ard Louis miracles, I've written an essay on this, um, going into this in more detail. Um, and I don't actually speak about consciousness particularly, but I talk about the, the bigger, the meta question that you're asking, which is really how can Christian, how can a scientist believe that there are things that like miracles, right? So I, if I die and I am then taken into a new creation, into heaven in some way or the other, that would be miraculous in the sense of not being the way that we're used to thinking about the laws of nature working. And it, at first instance, that seems very strange. How could a scientist possibly believe that? And my argument I make in, in my article, which is a fairly simple one, is to say, if you believe there's a God who created the world, who sustains the world, it would be very surprising if that God could not sometimes sustain the world in a different way, okay, if he so wanted to, or change things in other ways. Right? That would be a small step compared to the complexity of making the world. So it's not a diff big, difficult logical leap once you've made that assumption. That's the, you know, I, I quoted John Polkinghorne's two ways of looking at the world to try to make that clear, that if I take the point of view that there is a God, I make that assumption, and then I look at the world, then a lot of these things that seem strange are not that strange. If I assume there's no God, then obviously anything that has God linked in it will seem strange, but that's because that's, that's, that's not a conclusion that comes from there, it's an assumption. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, 
I, I know that the number of um, sort of um, secondary school, sixth form college students, which is, which is fantastic. I wonder whether there's anybody, a uh, question from someone uh, from a secondary school or sixth form college, uh, actually even staff or, or students uh, are, are both fine. I know it's a lot of people here <laughs> to ask a question, but any questions? Sorry if I put you on the spot. Okay, great. Yep, go, go for it. Um, you said that you believe in evolution. How does that link in in terms of the um, Bible from Genesis when it talks about the creation of Adam, Adam and Eve? Great, thank you. So the question is, um, I believe, do I believe in uh, I believe in evolution? So evolu uh, first, I should say evolution is a very complicated word. It means many things. It can mean um, the complexity of life changed over time from early life on, this, on our Earth was something unicellular prokaryotic, very simple cells. Now we've got something, you know, all kinds of animals around, much more complicated, so there's a change. The second question would be, how did that change happen? And then we would talk about natural selection and variation as being one of the, the best ways of explaining how that change may have happened, although there may be lots of questions we're still left with how that works. And then there's evolution as a big picture, kind of evolutionism, the idea that evolution um, is a worldview that tells us who we are. So classic example would be Richard Dawkins saying, you know, evolution allows us to be self-fulfilled atheists. Or George Gerard Simpson saying, um, basically saying that we are the product of, we, man is a product of evolutionary process that did not have him in mind, right? These are meta questions that I don't think the science does at all. So when we talk about evolution, it's really important that we decouple those and that we don't import these evolutionism into our story. And then what you're really talking about is, if we believe, that, if a Christian believes that God created the world, the question would be, how did God create the world? So I gave you my example of self-assembling Lego blocks. So one way could be God made the world all in, as it is now, or almost as it is now, 6,000 years ago, which would be like me making fully formed Lego trains for my children. The other way would be say God created a process by which these things happened, which would be like giving my children boxes of Lego and they shake it, and out comes a train. Now that train may have a few scratches on it from that process, but I think, with my children at least, would be a lot, I think the second one is a lot cooler than the first. So that's a kind of natural theological, I look at the science and ask myself, what does it mean? The second question I think you're asking is probably linked to, how do I interpret the Bible? What is Genesis saying to me? And then I think it's really important that when we read the Bible that we take it as a piece of, as look at what, what is it actually saying? What's the genre? What kind of literature is there? And so when you read the Genesis text, you find something really interesting and, is, and, and quite surprising at first sight. So the Genesis text starts with the days. There's a first day, there's morning and evening of the first day, morning and evening of the second day, morning and the third day, and it goes on. So the first day was light and darkness were made on the first day. The sun and moon are not created until the fourth day. Now, you don't have to be a modern scientist to realize that the sun and the moon are needed for morning and evening, okay? So... What was the author trying to do? Well, you can look further in the text. The words are not sun and moon. The words are greater lamp and lesser lamp. Same word for lights in your tent. So why, we think, well, okay, fine. Yeah, if you want to use that word, you can. But imagine the context. In that day, the intelligentsia, the scientists of the world were astrologers. They believed that the sun and the moon and the stars were living creatures, beings that controlled our lives. So what this author is saying is, I'm demoting these things to the fourth day. They're not that important. They don't even need them for morning and evening. Not only that, they're not beings up in the sky. They're physical objects, okay? It's actually fairly recent that our telescopes are strong enough to adjudicate once and for all that is true. Okay, that was a scientific claim that was made by the author. And this tells us something. This tells us that this text was not meant to be read as a kind of journalistic narrative um, and very different from other parts of the Bible. So if you take the Gospel of Luke, which is, Luke was a doctor who wrote about the life of Jesus, he starts by saying, you know, I'm, I wrote these things down in an orderly way to his friend Theo Theophilus. He's writing something that would be more akin to way, some way someone would write history today. It's not quite modern history in its writing style, like something very, but it's, very, it's clearly a reportage. He's writing down what he thinks journalistically happened. Those were completely different texts. And the minute you realize that, then there's quite a bit of freedom in understanding Genesis. In fact, Genesis becomes much richer I just gave you one example of what it's telling you. It's telling you that we shouldn't be astrologers, okay? But that was crazy. For the people at the time, that would be as crazy as if I went here to the whole Department of Physical Astronomy and told them in the science lecture that 
the sun and moon were controlling our lives. You know, they would probably be kicking me out <laughs> very quickly. Right? And so that was a, a strange and weird thing to say, but it's very powerful. And so if you start understanding that and looking at Genesis, you'll in that first chapters, you'll see all kinds of really important things. The fact that God created human beings. It doesn't say the mechanism by which he created them, but he created them, that they are loved by God, that humans have a mandate to care for creation. All kinds of things are in there that are incredibly important. And we, 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 when we try to look at it in, as if it's a piece of journalism, we're actually missing out on something very profound. Thank you. Um, just one more last question. Okay, I think this gentleman has been there <laughs> waiting patiently, so... May it not be that uh, the case that questions that science cannot answer are unanswerable, it follows that your religious answers are illusory or fallacious. Um, so I, I think I tried to say that maybe one of the most important points I hope to make today is the following one, which is that there are lots of questions that science can't answer. Um, and the idea that therefore they are not important questions is actually a dangerous thought. What happens in practice is, because there are lots of questions that science can't answer, if you say you can only be answered by questions, what really happens is people who are scientists wrap themselves in the mantle of science and pronounce on them anyway. The idea that, the idea that any question that can't be scientifically answered is therefore a non-question was formalized in what's called logical positivism in the 30s, 40s, 50s. It's a philosophical uh, trend which has died out largely um, because it was sterile. Um, and. Uh, it's come back a little bit in the New Atheist. There's a kind of logical positivism underlying it, but no serious philosopher would take that um, as being anything other than silly. So um, there's, it's unquestionably true that there are many really important questions in life, like what does it mean to be human? What's the value of a human being? How do I live my life? Is there a God or is there not a God? What does it be, mean to be moral that science cannot answer? But that doesn't make those questions any less important. It just tells us that we've got to think about them in a different way. And in fact, you know, that's why it's important for our universities not to become just science, technology training um, factories, because we need other people uh, to teach us. That's why it's really important that this was like theology are embedded into our universities, because they help us think about these big questions. We may not agree with everything that pe other people say, but we have to learn how to interact with them. We have to learn how to think about them. And we have to think carefully and deeply about them. Did you want to push back on that, or? No? OK, great. Um, let me. Well, there seems to be an, a growing appetite for questions now um, <laughs> uh, from the audience. Um, I'll, I'll, yeah, j that, that gentleman there. Oh, poor selfie is a bit uh, <laughs> bored, but all the questions seem to be coming here. Great. Um, hello. Um, with constant um, conflict going on within your field, um, the subject can be quite subjective. Um, that being said, do you feel theoretical physicists deviate too much away from actual science? <laughs> yeah, thank you. You're questioning the whole basis <laughs> so, of this. So I, I think, um, I think um, okay, give, me, give me an example. Could you give me an example of where you think we might be deviating from science? Um, so maybe, for example, um, theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, okay. they don't go well yeah. together. Okay, I understand. For example. You. Good, excellent. So, I, that's a, so the, qu the, the question is, this is actually a very topical question at the moment, a very good one. So in physics, we have forces, so we have the electroweak force, the strong force, which is a nuclear force, the weak force is a nuclear force, and then we have gravity, okay? So there's a standard model, which connects the first three and explains them extremely well, which the last particle was found uh, in CERN not too long ago, the Higgs boson, for which Peter Higgs, um, who from, was from Edinburgh, got the Nobel Prize for. Um, but then there's gravity, which we don't know how to connect up together. And so the, the dominant theory at the moment among my colleagues for how this would work is called string theory, um, which is a mathematical construction, very beautiful mathematical construction. It unfortunately lives in 10 or 11 dimensions, and we're used to having four dimensions. And so you've got to wrap up six or seven of those. Um, we have four dimensions, three, time and three, three space at one time. And so there's a, the, the discussion which has been very prominent in the field is we've been doing this for 30 years. Um, we've not made it a empirical prediction yet that could be tested. Um, so is this real science or has it turned into something else? I think that's the question that you're asking. And the answer to that is, I think we need to take a good look at this subset of physics 
and ask ourselves whether we might need to use different ways of adjudicating it. It's more like philosophy than science at the moment. Um, on the other hand, it's still, a, it, you may think 30 years is a long time, but it's not a long time for something as complicated as string theory. We don't understand it well enough yet to make this kind of prediction. So my friends who are string theorists will say, you wait, 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 we'll, we'll get something to you soon. <laughs> um, but in the rest of physics, no. So for us, it's extremely important that experiments um, test our theories. There's a saying among my colleagues and I, there are many beautiful theories that were ruined by an ugly experiment, <laughs> by which we mean the experiment shows the beautiful theory to be wrong. Okay? And so uh, it's incredibly important in science that we, ha we have experimental verification because we often can go down rabbit warrens where we're sure we're right and it ends up not being true. Okay, I think, um, let me just say, we've, um, sadly, um, we've almost uh, run out of time. Uh, but uh, before we finish, I, think I thought it would be nice um, if you had any final thoughts that you wanted to, to leave uh, with us as a sort of take-home uh, message, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So sorry to just put you on the spot now. Well, yeah, no. So yeah, so um, uh, well, thank you very much for coming. Um, one final thought would be that it's, you know, it's really important to wrestle with these big questions. The fact that you're here means you're a very self-selected audience. I think in the world around us, a lot of people just live their lives. Um, they go to the shopping mall, they go on holiday, and they just hope not to think about these things. Clearly, you're different because you wouldn't be here otherwise. I think it's super important. And so we need to think about these big questions and not just assume that you can um, just live life without thinking about them. Um, for me, the story of Jesus Christ was absolutely transformative in my own life. It completely changed how I think about things. And so I think you have to think about that very carefully as well. Perhaps read one of the Gospels fresh as if you've never seen it before and ask yourself, what does this really mean? Is this the kind of language you might get from God who came to earth? Um, but I realize for some of you that may not be that interesting. For me, that was really something very helpful. And so uh, those are probably my last words I leave with you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Art, um, for uh, do doing such a tremendous job. It's a huge topic, I realize. It, it, in such a short time, it's, it's impossible to, to completely uh, cover everything, obviously, but you've done a tremendous job. So uh, let's, let's show our appreciation to our speaker. So, brilliant. <laughs>